Good morning and welcome to Fifth Street Baptist Church where Reverend Dr. Joshua Dreyer's our pastor and this is our Sunday School Hour with the Senior Adult Class. My name is Vaughn Summers and I'll be the facilitator for this session. You know, we, we, we have been studying from the theme Essentials of Christianity and this is session number two of a six session study series. This session number two is entitled The Purpose of Humanity. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for your great work. Even from the beginning of time, Father, we thank you for loving us so much when you created the earth just for us to dwell in and serve and honor you. By serving and honoring you, Lord, we find true purpose in our existence here on earth. This was lost when we sinned against you in the garden. However, you have provided another opportunity to serve and honor you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we ask you, Lord, to help us to see clearly our job that you require of us and to your creation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our picture question is found on page number 28 of your personal study guides. The question states, what is your least favorite household responsibility? Well, the picture refers to Robbie Gallaty sharing that one of his responsibilities at home is taking out the trash. He said, and I quote, taking out the trash is not a difficult task. But somehow I managed to forget to do this simple, obvious thing, end quote. Now we find that when God created the world, he gave us us specific responsibilities to carry out. With these responsibilities come expectations that we will act in such a way as to meet the expectations of those responsibilities. Now when God created first the first man and woman, he gave them responsib the responsibility of being his representatives over all creation. Every person since then has been given that same function. Whether or not they recognize that role or act in such a way as to fulfill their duties. Our scripture text is taken from the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Verses within that chapter will be verses 1 through 5 and 26 through 31. The point of this session will be God created us to serve and honor him. Let's pray before we study our Bibles. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to help us to honor and serve you as we study this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We divide those verses into three sections. The first section will be Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, the book of Genesis, as a background, is a book of beginnings. In fact, the book's name comes from its opening words, in the beginning, along with the account of creation. Genesis records the origins of human life and relationships. The first sin, the rise of human civilization. Perhaps most important, Genesis provides the context of God's covenant with his people through Abraham. This Abrahamic covenant eventually pointed God's people to his provision of a savior. Note three things to keep in mind when we want to communicate with an audience. We find this on page 30 of your personal study guides before we get started. What are they familiar with is a question. What do we need to tell them? Another question. How do we bridge the gap between those two? Now keep these, these, keep these three things in mind as we read the account of the creation given by God the Creator. In verse 1, it says, of Genesis chapter 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. 
Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Note the keyword section on page 19 of your personal study guides that provides information about the word created. The word created is used in verse 1 from the Hebrew word bara, describes the activity of making. When used in the Old Testament, God is always the one performing the creative action. In our verse-by-verse -verse discussion, in verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We find that Moses wrote Genesis as a history for the people of Israel during their years of wilderness wandering. The opening verses of the Bible remind readers of God's power and creativity as he brought the world into, begin, into, into being. As humans, our story starts with God. He is the main character of the scripture. The Hebrews use two primary words for God, Yahweh and Elohim. Elohim is used in Genesis 1 because in the context of creation, it refers to God's power and majesty. Now, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God, the opening words of Scripture simply assume God. He was already there in the beginning. The reference to heavens and earth represent the totality of God's crea cre creative work. Nothing is, it, nothing is excluded. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Verse 2 says, The earth was formless and empty. The word empty can also be translated void, reinforcing the idea of nothingness. The presence of the living Spirit of God was hovering over the lifeless void. The Hebrew implies he moved above, above what, what there was of the world at that point. The entire Trinity had a hand in the work of creation. Remember in the New Testament, John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That word, Word, is another name for Jesus Christ. Also in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, it says this, he is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is, in verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Note the statement on page 31 of your personal study guides about our access to the Father, the creator of the universe. Jesus is in a special position to do that for us because not only is He one of the, with the Father, He was actually present at creation. The Word, or Jesus, was with God in the beginning, as was stated in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Not a single thing that has been created was created apart from Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. So what can we learn about God from these first words of the Bible? And what difference does it make that the Creator not the creation, is at the center of the creation story. In verse 3 it says, Then God said, Let there be light. 
and there was light. In the midst of confusion, God broke into broke in to create order. God's work highlighted two specific truths. First, God demonstrated his power through the spoken word. Let there be light. There was no magical trick or formula. He simply spoke and light came into being. It came into being because he said so. Second, Moses emphasized that God created the world out of nothing. Information tells us that theologians use the Latin term ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing, to describe how God brought things into being without pre-existing materials. Other theories about origins of, of the world often assume pre-existing matter, but struggling to explain, but struggle to explain how it came into being. Now the Bible simply understands God didn't need it. His power and authority are enough to bring something out of nothing. God began creation with light. This light was not connected to a particular source. Since the, moon, the sun, the moon, and the stars would not be created until later. The light produced here is actually an expression of God's presence. God, who is decent and in order, took the next step of separating light from darkness. In verse 4, he said, God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Now, just because light is good does not mean that dark is automatically bad. Information tells us that the Hebrew word for good has a wide spectrum of meanings. Here the light is good because it fulfills God's plan of dealing with darkness. It also includes the idea of wholeness. Everything God created was perfect and full without any flaws. He also used light to limit the darkness and to give it order and purpose. It also shows God's role as judge, as creator. God is qualified to determine good and bad and to serve as the standard for such judgments. In verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. God gave two elements names. To the light he called day, and to darkness he called night. Time was also established through this action. Also through this action, humanity would be able to discern evening and morning, which would make up one day. Information tells us that in the ancient world, naming indicated ownership and authority. And God exerted his authority when he provided names for light and darkness. God would later delegate some of his authority to Adam to name the other animals. We find this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Next, we will learn that we were created in the image of God and what that means. As we continue, continue to study the Bible in section 2, those verses in Genesis chapter 1 will be verses 26 and 27. In verse 26 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Note the keyword section on page 32 of your personal study guides, which gives an explanation of the word image. It says, this is humanity's reflection of God. It cannot be reduced to a list of qualities. Instead, it encompasses every aspect of our being. Now in verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. 
he created them. In our verse by verse discussion, verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over all and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now the word then indicates God's previous crea creative activity into the sixth day. Information tells us that the, that Bible scholars see a parallelism to the order of these days. In day one, where we find light, it corresponds to day four, which we find the sun, moon, and stars. In day two, where we find waters and sky, corresponds to day five, where we find fish and birds. In day three, where there's land and plants, corresponds to day six, where we find land animals. Also on the sixth day, God turned his attention to his final and ultimate project. He created people. There would be some resemblance between land animals and humanity in some ways, but people would be very different in other ways. Humans would rule over the rest of God's creation. But more importantly, humans were created for relationship with God. To be made in the image of God means we were made with something the rest of creation doesn't have. Our ability to think, reason, and process morality is different. We have the capacity to adapt and tame the land around us, no matter what the land looks like. We were created to be God's representatives. He made humanity with the unique responsibility of being his re representatives on earth. As his bearers, as his image bearers, I should say, we were created to rule over the animals and over the earth. The Hebrew word translated rule means to subjugate, to have dominion, or to reign. Now humans made in God's image are capable of thinking and discerning and making choices as God's ruling representatives of, of, of governing the earth in his place. So humans were created for relationships, specifically a relationship with God. Now God spoke in verse 26 with, within the Godhead, as indicated by their plural phrases, let us our image, and our likeness. Now Genesis emphasizes the unity of the Trinity and the participation of each member in the creation. Humans are created in God's image, which means humanity shares certain characteristics of God. In verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, information tells us that this verse is written in poetic form. This verse also emphasizes three important truths about the origin of humanity. <clears throat> First, the passage makes it clear, God created man. <clears throat> the writer used the Hebrew word for the word created he used in verse 1 to describe a creative work only God can do. He used this word three times. <coughs> Excuse me. Now within this information, the Hebrew word Adam, from which the first human got his name, however, refers to the human race in general in this context. The second truth reminds us that God not only created people, but he created them in his own image. Created with a personality, creativity, and appreciation for beauty. And also created with a purpose as spiritual beings. Now we are called to reflect God's character to the world. And the third truth is that God created human beings with diversity. The distinction between genders was not an accident. 
male and female, were part of God's plan from the beginning. So what are the implications that we were created in God's image? And how does it make you feel to know God created you in his image? In the next verses, we will see God's purpose for humanity in creation as we continue to study the Bible in section 3. Those verses in Genesis chapter 1 will be verses 28 through 31. Now verse 28 says, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verse 29 says, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, in verse 31, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Note the key word section on page 34 of your personal study guides, with an explanation of the word subdue, from verse 28. It says, to bring into subjection. However, while humans are called to put creation under their authority, this is only possible if they stand under God's authority. In our verse-by-verse -verse discussion, verse 20 uh, ref says that God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gave humanity a blessing. Information tells us that some scholars refer to this as a blessing of the marriage covenant, which also endorses sexuality in marriage and makes upcoming commands possible. Second, he gave humans a command he would hold them accountable to complete the assignment. The command, be fruitful and fill the earth. This relates to procreation and to spread out across the earth so they could oversee and protect the earth. Third, was the command to subdue the created order. Human beings have authority over the created order. We are called to be stewards of creation. Note the three tasks God gave us on page 34 of your personal study guides. Be fruitful and fill the earth. Subdue the earth. Relish everything that God made because he made it all to be enjoyed. So how would you describe our responsibility for taking care of the world God created? Verses 29 and 30. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Now all the people and all wildlife, including birds flying in the sky and insects crawling on the ground, find their sustenance in God. He is Lord over all creation and cares about all he has made. In verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now the Lord declared his work very good from a dark, empty nothingness, God produced order and organization. He brought light out of darkness and life out of nothing at all. He gave human beings the privilege of enjoying his work and the responsibility of caring for it. Now in our culture, some individuals tend to worship the, cre the creation more than the creator. 
This misplaced worship does not eliminate the requirement God has placed on his people regarding what he has made. Without the wise use of our resources, we desecrate God's work and put our own existence in jeopardy. We also fall short of accurately reflecting God's image to the world. Believers are called to protect our planet, including water, land, and animals. Even though it is a blessing from God to enjoy, we cannot abuse it or allow others to abuse it. So what does the creation story teach us about God? And how do, and how do these verses summarize our mission and purpose as stewards of God's creation? Note the activity on page 36 of your personal study guides as we live this out this week. Being made in the image of God is a great blessing but it's also a huge responsibility. Consider the following action steps. Praise. Take a few minutes to thank God for creating us. We should thank him for creating us in his image. We should ask for his help to live out this great privilege and responsibility. And then list. We should write down a few characteristics that God's image bears should have and evaluate ourselves on them. How can we better represent the Lord? And then disciple. We are to lead others to know and grow in Christ, the one who restores the sin-marred image of God in us. Who are two other people in your life with whom you can begin meeting regularly so that you can help them, help them to be like him? Make a plan to reach out to them, if possible. So the point of this session is God created us to serve and honor him. Let's wrap this up this week. Please be mindful of our assignments as caretakers of God's creation. Don't forget our special status. Created in the image of God. As we close in prayer. Father, we ask for filling of the Holy Spirit to see people, to see situations and things as you see them, so that we can be good stewards of all your creation that you have entrusted, entrusted us with. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.